when that thief on the cross hung that day and he said, Jesus, and he said, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, Adonai. He was saying that name that only the Kohen Gadol, the great high priest, could say one time a year. He had found his Passover. Hallelujah. Praise God. This whole place is inundated with the worship and the power of God. And if you leave here unchanged and unfulfilled with a need in your life, it's not God's fault. It's not going to be my fault because I'm going to load your wagon here in a minute. Hallelujah. It's not going to be Brother Keller's fault. And he's going to pray for you. If you leave here with a need in your life, it's going to be your fault because you didn't touch him when he was coming by. Hallelujah. God is available to people that will touch Him. We withdraw ourselves from Him by times, but it's because we withdraw, not because He withdraws. We say, boy, God really come down. No, I didn't, man. He was already down. God's everywhere. You can't go anywhere God ain't. Hallelujah. But what we do is get ourselves in tune with God where we can get in contact with God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, we love you all and, and enjoyed being here with Brother and Sister Keller and meeting all the bros. Hallelujah. And uh, just feeling the presence of God. My wife said, tell you hello, and she apologized for her husband. I said, what are you talking about? She said, they'll know. Hallelujah. I don't know what she's talking about. Hallelujah. But uh, I don't know if, if, I could, if I could find words to articulate to you how that you need to put your faith and your love and everything you can behind this pastor and his family for this last day. Jesus is coming. Now, I know that's become a cliché with us. I know that's a cliché with us, but Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. If you just look at the Bible and look at the signs, then He's got to come soon. But if you look in, in uh, a typology and look at dispensational truths, then the year 2000, something's got to happen between now and then. Hallelujah. I don't want... This is not my text. Don't turn to it. But I'll just quote it for you. Matthew... The first chapter, the 17th verse, said all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from, the, from David unto the carrying away of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Messiah are 14 generations. You have three sets of 14 generations. That's 42 generations. The great chronologist Philo, which nobody's ever been able to refute what he said, said from Abraham to the birth of Messiah was 2,160 years. So if you want to find out what Matthew, who was the tribe of Levi or Levi, thought a generation was, you'd, you'd divide uh, 42 into 2,160. You can find out what that Jewish scribe thought a generation was. It comes out to 51.4 years. And Jesus says the generation that sees Israel become a nation this generation is going to see all the rest of this business taken care of and the coming of the Lord. That happened May the 14th, 1948. And you put 51.4 years on that. It comes out to 1999.9, just about the feast of Rosh Hashanah when they sound the last trumpet. Hallelujah. That's how close we are. Now, no man knows the day nor the hour. There's a cat that lives right around the corner from me in Little Rock, and he kind of shuns me anymore, but he wrote a book a few years ago, 88 Reasons Why the Lord's Coming in 88. Well, he was so far behind, he thought he was coming in first. Hallelujah. But nobody knows the day nor the hour. But we know that it's time to get ourselves ready because Jesus is coming. And I don't want anything dragging me down. I said, I don't want anything in my personality, my attitude, anything in me dragging me down and keeping me from the rapture. 
Now, if God spoke to me and told me not to wear a necktie anymore, and uh, he hadn't, hallelujah. I know it is your papa, hallelujah, but, but uh, if God spoke, I'd do it because God said do it. And we're living in the day when we've got to prove everything and, and we've got to beg everybody. When I came in, if my pastor would have told me to wear an orange shirt with red polka dots and green witches with purple stripes, I'd have done it because a man of God said do it. <laughs> That's right, and amen. Spell off a little there, but I love you anyhow. Hallelujah. The ninth division of the book of Psalms. The ninth division of the book of Psalms. Boy, it's good having that music director back. He is anointed and leading that music, ain't he? Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Good to have them back. He's, he's, he's very anointed in leading music. Of course, he can't help what he looks like. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. I really became good friends with Brother Robbie. He, ain't he a neat guy? Hallelujah. Just a few more pounds and he can pass for me or Brother Billy Cole. Either one. It don't matter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Somebody asked me, said, is all preachers fat? And I said, just the good ones. Hallelujah. So that makes Pastor Keller one of our top ministers in the whole movement. Hallelujah. Thank God. The ninth division of the book of Psalms. The ninth verse. The ninth division of the book of Psalms. By the way, this is the only, just a little point of interest. I know that you're not going to tear the pews up over this, but, but uh, this is the only book in the Bible that's in divisions. The rest of all that business, the King James boys put it in there, so you can understand it in Lancaster, 1995. Hallelujah. But this is the ninth division of the book of Psalms. The ninth verse. Read this with me. Let's all read together. I love it when the, the body reads together. The Lord also shall be a refuge from, for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken, that, forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them, he forgetteth not the cry of the humble. The twelfth verse, let's read that again. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them, he forgetteth not the cry of the humble. You may be seated. God bless you all. Hallelujah. Now, nearly everybody that's got a Bible in this place that was uh, spiritual enough to pack that baby to church with you, if you look at the dedication, each psalm, each psalm uh, has a dedication. One is dedicated on the uh, musical instrument. Another, Yadufan. Another, uh, Asa, which were music directors or musical instruments. You can't separate the ministry and the music. The music never takes the place of the preaching. The music plows the field and sets up the thing so the seed can be planted. But this ninth division of the book of Psalms is so unique. If you look at the dedication, where you close your Bible up there, Pastor Keller, let's look at the dedication together. And the chief musician upon what? Mutlaben. Mutlaben. A Psalm of David. Mutlaben in the Hebrew means the death of a son. And most of your Bible scholars believe that when David wrote this Psalms, he was referring to 2 Samuel, the 20th verse, when his child died. Him and uh, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, had a little affair, and they produced a child, and the sin of their parents fell on that first child. See, the reason people think they sin and get away with it is because Calvary is so powerful, it holds the judgment phase of sin off of them. You ain't got away with nothing, hot rod. 
Come on, there's a judgment day coming. There's going to come a day when us old time holiness people are going to thank God we live for God. Hallelujah. Because there's a payday. You know what our trouble is? Is, is we, we're not tempted by things that we like, and we still love sin just a little bit. That's why we're tempted by sin. You can stack this whole platform full of asparagus, and it wouldn't tempt me. I am not eating anything green that's got warts on it, man. But I swore to God almost to my wife before I left, I'd stay on my diet. And when you see her, Keller, now if you put two or three gallons of butter, brickle, or pralines and cream ice cream up here, I'd be one tormented camper. You know why? I love that. And you know why we're tempted by things? Because there's still a little bit of that sin that our old man loves, and we hadn't put it to the cross yet. But when we die, when we die we're going to hate the sin that put him on that old rugged cross. This psalm is dedicated to the death of a son. And it wasn't just talking about David's son by, by uh, the wife of Uriah. It was talking about another son that was going to be born where he would come and he would be the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world and he would hang on that cross and take the curse for every one of us. He hung there and became the lightning rod that God's wrath came down through and he took all the curse for me. Stalin, Joseph Stalin said America is just one generation away from atheism. All we got to do is just skip one generation teaching our kids how to pray, and we'll have an atheist nation. All we got to do is just skip one generation teaching our girls that they need to dress modest, and we'll have an atheist generation. All we got to do is leave off Bible reading one time, one generation, and we've got an atheist generation. The Bible likens children under arrows. How many knew that the Bible likens children under arrows? A man with a lot of children is like a man with his uh, quiver full of arrows. We had three kids. That's all I promise you before God I wanted. Hallelujah. But the Bible likens children under arrows. And I asked a rabbi one time, I said, Rabbi, why does the Bible liken children under arrows? He said, because arrows go where we aim them. And so does children. Hallelujah. Come on. We taught our boys, our young preachers, that success in the ministry is wearing a Louis Ross suit, alligator hide shoes, and a, and a $75 necktie. But that's not real success in the ministry. Success in the ministry is preaching until you can walk away from that pulpit with your integrity saying, I delivered my soul with everything I had in me. The cross, the nails, the whip, the fist. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Now listen to this. By his stripes were healed. But bruising is bleeding inwardly. He was bruised for our Mental healing. He was bruised to take away our generational curses that's on us. Fred Hyde, the director of our alcoholism, alcohol, how did he say it? Alcoholism. Oh, God, hallelujah. Asked me one time, he said, you was an alcoholic, wasn't you, Charlie? And I said, no, I wasn't, Fred. He said, you wasn't an alcoholic? And I said, no, I was a drunkard. He said, what's the difference? I said, drunkards don't have to go to the meetings, man. There's not much I admire about a drunk. I don't like the way they talk. I don't like the way they walk. I don't like the way they smell. I don't like the way they blow their money on, on booze that they ought to be spending for groceries. But there's one thing I admire about those guys. They don't care who's looking at them. They've got something in them, and everybody's going to know about it. 
Brother Fred Hyde, Brother Keller knows Brother Hyde real well. And, and uh, he told me he's got an 800 number that drunks could call in and uh, have counseling. And he said a drunk called him a while back, and, and Brother Hyde's got a set of questions he asks every drunk that calls in to see how serious a drinking problem they have. And the first question, do you ever hear voices when you can't see anybody? That's called DTs. And, and, and this drunk called in and said, i got a drinking problem, preacher. And Brother Hyde said, do you ever hear voices when you can't see anybody? And the drunk said, yes, I do. Brother Hyde said, you're kidding me. You hear voices and you can't see anybody? He said, yes, I do, preacher. And Brother Hyde said, how often do you hear voices and you can't see anybody? And the drunk said, every time I talk on the telephone, man. I told Brother Hyde, I said, it's bad when a drunk smarter than you are. Hallelujah. Listen, you can't hide from me. You're too close to Kentucky. we got some old moonshine drinkers sitting right in this place right now. I can spot you. I'll tell you how. It's not discerning the spirits, Robbie. I'll tell you how I spot them. they got that line across their nose where they held their fruit jar up there. Hallelujah. And those spirits of alcoholism follow your families. Depression follows your families. These things follow your families. And the only way to break them is the blood breaks the power of sin. There's two words for dominion in the Hebrew. One is yade, yade. And it means that things that naturally succumb or surrender will do it. That's Yadde. Then there's another word for dominion in the Hebrew. It's kabosh. My grandma used to say, I'm going to put the kabosh on you, boy. And that means to put you under her foot. Hallelujah. And there's spirits that when you come and you repent, that automatically leave you. They leave because the blood is applied. And the devil can't stay around the blood. Come on, when you repent, when you come to an altar, there's people that's had spirits bothering you. When you walked in here, automatically those demons begin to back away from you and begin to leave you alone. Those spirits, now, but then there's spirits even after you're born again. I, I don't believe you can be born again, baptized in Jesus' name, fill the Holy Ghost, and have a devil. I don't believe that business. I know we got guys that teach that. But uh, I believe that if God lives in you, and I'm full of the Holy Ghost, I don't believe Jesus and the devil is going to cohabitate. Come on. I believe when God fills you with the Holy Ghost, baby, He fills you with the Holy Ghost. But you know what? There's things that bug you. There's things that bug you that the devil still knows bugs you. So what he does is he keeps tormenting you with those things, and they're in your physical makeup. The Bible said that down in Egypt they took the blood and put it in a basin and took hyssop and put it on the doorpost, the lintel, and the doorpost. The blood saved them, but when they ate the lamb and tore the lamb with their teeth, then the blood healed them and delivered them. It's one thing to get saved. It's another thing to stay under the blood and stay in the presence of God until all those yesterdays begin to lead your life. <laughs> Say, well, how do you apply the blood? You've got to have hyssop to apply blood scripturally. Hallelujah. Now let me show you something. There's only one place that hyssop will grow. It won't grow out of the ground. It won't grow out of a bank or clot of dirt. There's only one place hyssop will grow out of, and that's out of a rock. Hyssop will only grow out of a rock. Ain't that weird? That's the only plant I've ever heard of that it won't grow out of dirt. It grows out of a rock. And Jesus was our rock. Hallelujah. And our hyssop is the words that he spoke. And how you apply the blood is you take the word he spoke and dip it in the blood of the word and apply it to your life. And then you stand your ground and you confess your faith until it comes to pass. They call it the good fight. 
The good fight of faith. Why they call it the good fight? Because we know who's going to win. If me and Robbie was going to fight, it'd be a good fight for me and a bad one for him. Hallelujah. It's a good fight because we know if we'll stand our ground, God is going to give us the victory. There was a woman in England named Susanna that had 19 kids. I don't know if anybody can be saved that had 19 kids. But she had 19 kids, and the only way she could pray is she would put her apron over her head. And that was her prayer closet. She never got to go to Ben Yehuda Street and buy a prayer shawl. She just put that apron over her head. And that mama prayed and took hold of God and rebuked the devil. And England was at the lowest point in the history of England. Every, every five out of every seven people were alcoholics. And out of her 19 kids, she had two boys, one named John and one named Charles, that turned America and England towards Jesus because that mama took hold of God and pled the blood over her family. There was a lady in Bavaria that had a son. And she was in the occult and witchcraft. In the 70s, the, the Satan church put a contract out on me. Gonna, gonna rub me out. Big old dude come after me. His arm's about the size of this microphone cord here. And he said, we got a contract on you. And I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, we don't like the way you get up and run the devil down. And we got a contract on you, and we're going to rub you out. <laughs> and I said, let me tell you something, Cat. Between me and you, there's a bloodline. And the devil can't get through that blood. And if he got through the blood, he'd be a saved devil, and we'd have a fellowship meeting. <laughs> you know what? Fear is one of those generational curses. I've never been saddled with fear. I'm not going to lie in the pulpit. There's one thing. Try not to lie anywhere. Hallelujah. Getting awful close to April 15th. Hallelujah. I'm not going to, Barb. Hallelujah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stress. Nothing I'd rather do than send my money up there and, and support more lesbians and, and baby killers in Washington. Hallelujah. But there's one thing I'm afraid of. I've never seen a crowd I was afraid of. I've never seen a devil I was afraid of. But there's one thing I'm afraid of, and it's dogs. I can be in a crowd of a hundred people, and if there's a biting dog there, that sucker will nail me. I don't know what he looks and says, look, a buffet or what? But... And I've always loved to witness. My wife and I will go in a restaurant and, and, and uh, and before I leave that restaurant, I'll be back in there laying hands on the cook and, and, uh, and, and praying for the waiter's family and, and every place. They all call me Pastor Mahaney in uh, Little Rock. Don't even pastor. Hallelujah. But I always love to witness it. I just got in church and four of us, young preachers, said, let's go witness it one Saturday morning. So they said, we've never witnessed before. And we got, you could send off for a dollar and get 25 tracks from the publishing house back then. That's before they ever moved it where it's at. So we all went out and they said, who will talk? And I said, I'll do the talking. I used to sell elevator tickets in one-story buildings before I was a preacher. You never heard anybody with relatives named Isaac Golden that couldn't sell. So we walked up there and, and uh, walked in the gate and I clicked the gate shut behind me. And one of the guys said, I can't get the gate open behind me. And I said, well, I'll talk to him. And when I get him under conviction... Uh, and I pray for him. You come up here and we'll all pray him through to the Holy Ghost and we'll take him to the church and baptize him. And I walked up and knocked on the door and about that time, I looked coming around the yard there and there was a great big black German shepherd just about that tall. You could actually hear the ground rumble when it run. <laughs> and that dog come at me and the devil said, he's going to nail you, Mahaney. I said, the first time you ever told the truth, you sucker, and it had to be on me. <laughs> and I'd read that morning, I'd read that morning that a German shepherd, when it bites down, has 80 pounds jaw pressure. 
My pastor Wednesday night had taught God delivered David from the lion and the bear because God was getting David ready for Goliath. And I said, God, if you can deliver David, you can deliver Charlie. And I lifted my hand and said, in Jesus' name. And that dog run up and boy and just clamped down on Michael. Rock! And when it did, it didn't hurt. It felt real funny. And he, and he nailed me again. And, and about that time, the lady stepped out. She said, don't worry. We had all those teeth pulled, so it couldn't hurt anybody. <laughs> that dog standing there gumming me on the leg. I said, excuse me? She said, we had all those teeth. I said, get out of here. And about that time, the other preachers come in. I said, come in, almighty men of valor. Hallelujah. And I got to worshiping God. They said, what are you shouting about, Mahaney? I said, that old dog reminds me of the devil. He barks and growls and says what all he's going to do. But when he gets to us, he can't do anything. 1,900 years ago, God pulled his teeth on an old rugged cross. Do you know, do you know when you marry today that you marry somebody that you marry all their past? Come on. You marry their abuses, their hurts, their hang ups, their emotional problems. I talked to a girl the other day, told me she's been married five times. And she said, the one I'm living with now, I'm just living in sin. I've been married five times. And I said, at least you're scriptural. She said, I need help. She said, she said, I, I love this man that we're uh, living. I don't want to say shack up with in the pulpit, but, but uh, I love this man that I'm living with, and we're going to get married. So she said, I don't want this marriage to tear up. And I said, unless you change your life, the same thing that tore up your other marriages is going to tear this marriage up. You need a deliverance. You need a deliverance. You need a deliverance. And we need deliverance for Pentecostals. Because when God comes in and tries to bless you, and those old things from the past come up, and you divert your attention from the worship of Jesus Christ, and you look at those old hurts from the past, you know what you're doing? You're making an idol out of that thing, and you're worshiping that thing instead of worshiping God. And one of the ten meets bar, ten commandments, is you'll have no other God before me. You're committing idolatry when you let that thing draw your attention off of God. Say, so you've never been hurt. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have. I know this is going to, you, you won't even agree with this, but I've actually aggravated people while I was preaching. There are districts they told me I couldn't come back and preach to. I've been hurt. My trouble. See? I've got Hollywood taste in the Salvation Army pocketbook. I've got an 88 Cadillac. I think I ought to be driving a 95 town car. Things don't go away well with it all the time. I've never been paid what I thought I was worth in a revival. Come on. But I refuse to let things draw my attention from God when I'm in the poise of praise. Hallelujah. And worship at Him. Hallelujah. Come on, don't let that sit on the throne of your heart. Don't let, let that thing sit on the throne of your heart. Don't let that thing sit on the throne of your heart. Well, how can I deal with it? Well, you don't need to sit in and talk to a counselor all day long that's got more problems than you do. I went to a psychiatrist one time before I got saved, and then, and then right after I got saved, I'd never had a job before. I was 23 years old, never had a job before. And uh, I didn't really need to work. I didn't make big money like you people in uh, Ohio, but back in the 60s, I used to make $30,000 a night. And uh, I'm sure Brother Keller treated me good, but I doubt if I'll get $30,000 uh, each night for these three nights. 
If we do, I'm canceling Denver out next week. Me and the mama's going to Honolulu. Hallelujah. But I had to talk to a psychiatrist after I got saved and, and I was getting a job. And he uh, asked me, he said, when was you born? And I said, which time? He said, excuse me? And I said, I've been born twice. He said, what do you mean? I said, natural birth and spiritual birth. Had a woman get the Holy Ghost one night in Annapolis years ago that she had just about get to the place where she would speak in tongues and she had dentures and, and she couldn't speak in tongues. And, and Brother Usher told her, said, take your dentures out. She got her dentures out and got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Brother Urshan said, would you testify? And she said, I've been born twice. Natural birth and spiritual birth. I've never had a tooth in my head either time. Hallelujah. I was preaching the other night, Billy Cole came up to me and he said, I figured you out tonight, Charlie. I figured you out. He said, what you do, you tell those corny stories. And while we got our mouth open laughing, you got a spiritual principle poked in us so fast. We don't have time to get mad at you. If you didn't do that, so we'd be so mad we'd run you out of town. Hallelujah. I said, I've been born twice. He said, uh, what's your address? And I said, which address? He said, what do you mean? I said, i got earthly address and heavenly address. He said, your father's name. I said, which father? i got two daddies. Hallelujah. <laughs> He couldn't help me. I'm going to tell you what the answer is. The answer is to, is to go on about a three or four day fast around your house and pray, God, I want, you to, I want you to cause your Holy Spirit to manifest all those things that keep my family away from old time apostolic revival, that keep my family divided, hallelujah, that keep my family in turmoil, that make my kids rise up and be rebellious. I want you to manifest that, and when you do, I'm going to bleed the blood over it. I'm going to break that curse. I'm going to break that curse. I'm going to just tell you kids something here just a minute. You get those posters of those acid rock groups, and, and uh, I know I'm talking back in the 60s, Robbie, get off my case. <laughs> Heavy metal. Had a little boy I prayed through every year in California. Prayed him through in two youth camps, two youth conventions, and four revivals. Mama brought him up to me by the ear, 16 years old, and said, Talk to him! Have you read any good books lately, bud? <laughs> I was wondering, she said, He just can't stay in church. And I said, What's your problem, boy? He said, Nothing, Brother Mahane. He said, I live for God, but said, I go into my room and spirits attack me. And I said, Well, what do you got? Did you get rid of all your uh, rock music, all those devil worshipers and fags singing? All that business, hallelujah. He said, yes. I said, what do you got in your room? And, and he said, I got some posters. And inanimate objects can become holding points where those spirits cling to them and you contact those spirits through those inanimate objects. Come on. And the reason you've got problems with morality is because some of you sit there and watch those stinking soap operas all day long. As the world spins and as the stomach turns, and if you watch that business, you're backslid in your heart, and you need to repent of it and get that spirit out of your life. Come on. Country music. See, the parents like them when I get on the kids for the rock music. I get on the country music. Boy, they draw up. I felt you draw up. Buck Hager or whatever the name is. Kiss an angel good morning. Love her like the devil when you get back home. You play rock music backwards. They smoke dope. Worship the devil. You play country music backwards. They get out of jail. Quit riding freight trains and love their mother-in-law. Hallelujah. What's wrong with the music we heard tonight? What's wrong with music... 
Now, this is a sign I'm getting old. But I like music you can understand. Hallelujah. I like songs like Amazing Grace. I'd have wrote that if I'd have thought of it. <laughs> Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Hallelujah. I like music that draws the Holy Spirit instead of drives Him away. You don't need to talk to a counselor. You know what you need to do? You need to get a hold of God and let God take your life and turn it upside down for Him. Hallelujah. You know why? There was a lamb born in Bethlehem of Judah. Hallelujah. You know what? When you got saved, when I got saved, they said, Mahaney's not going to last a week. When I started preaching, they said, he's just another drug addict. He won't be here a year from now. You heard that, Keller. Hallelujah. It'd be like them other guys that come in. Hey, I got news for you, Hot Rod. I'm here! Come on. Some of you, they said, you'll never make it. You'll never stay in church. I want you to lift both of your hands and tell the devil, say, hey, I'm still here living for God, shouting the victory. I'm not what I need to be, but I'm a whole lot better than what I used to be. Now listen to this. When Paul was shipwrecked, there's, all, there's always storms and shipwrecks in our life. But at the darkest part of Paul's storm, an angel come down and stood on the deck of that ship. That angel never stopped the storm, never stopped the tempest, never stopped the rain, never stopped the lightning. He just come and stood by Paul. Hallelujah. There's some standby angels that will come and stand by us and see that we make it all the way through if we commit our life to Him. And that ship broke up. And it all washed up on the shore. And Paul began to pick up pieces of that broken ship that he was sailing on. You know what he done? He made the broken parts of his life become fuel for his revival he was headed to. Hallelujah. 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 He made the broken pieces of his life become fuel that he could burn to the revival he was headed to. The devil came out of it. He just shook him off. Hallelujah. Come on, take the broken places. Instead of making them stumbling stones, make them stepping stones. Hallelujah. A lamb. Everybody say a lamb came. Say a lamb came. Say a lamb came. Born at Bethlehem. Hallelujah. At first it was a lamb for a man. Then it became a lamb for a family. Then it became a lamb for a nation. And then one day John the Immerser, John the Baptist, stood in the Jordan River and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. Now watch this. John was of the tribe of Levi. Only a Levite could wash the sacrifice. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. When John put him under the Jordan River, it was a Levite washing the sacrifice that could heal me of my hurts. I've seen God take women that's been abused. And it doesn't happen overnight sometimes, but God just begins to heal. And God begins to wash. You need to get out of denial. You need to get out of denial. I'm writing a book for uh, the Home Mission Division right now called Life Recovery Challenge about a recovery. Dysfunctional families, destructive relationships, substance abuse. And I'm on page 300 and I can't find any place to stop. So I'm going to write them a catalog. Hallelujah. But you know what the number one problem is? Get out of denial. I don't have any problem. And you just flare off in rage. I don't have any problem. And you get mad at because the, the VA is too loud or it's too low. Or... I don't have any problems. And you get in depression. You get in that depression and you're hell on wheels, baby. Come on. You need to get out of denial. 
Because the Bible said if we'll get out of denial, then the Holy Spirit can pray through us and it helpeth our infirmities. Hallelujah. And when we get our infirmities out of the way, Paul said, I glory in those infirmities because every one I remove, the glory of God may dwell on me greater. There's a place where you pray where the Holy Spirit goes into cruise control and bypasses your intellect and you're praying in tongues. You know why I like to pray in tongues? Somebody asked me, said, said, do you have to pray in tongues every day? And I said, no, you get to pray in tongues every day. When I get back to Little Rock, I'm going to service merchandise and get me a watch with an alarm on it. And every 30 minutes, I'm going to have the alarm go off. And for about 30 days, wherever I'm at, I'm going to stop and lift my hands and talk in tongues. I'm going to have fun in those airports and on those planes. Hallelujah. But when I pray, listen, if I'm down here praying for... Brother Robbie, God, I want you to bless Brother Robbie. God help him. The devil hears that. So you know what he does? He runs over and tries to intercept that prayer and stop that prayer that I prayed for Brother Robbie. For Brother Keller. God bless Brother Keller up there. God anoint him. He's an anointed man, but God anoint him greater to lead that church into this last day. The devil hears that, and he tries to get him discouraged. But I've got a hotline between me and God that the devil can't understand what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. And when I begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, and when I begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, he bypasses my intellect. And you know what? The Holy Spirit doesn't pray anything on his own. All he can pray is what he hears. All he can say is what he hears. And he walks up to you in your hour of trial and said, I've been in the council chambers of heaven, and I come to tell you I heard everything was going to be all right. Don't ever forget this. There's a law of spiritual return. It's simply this. If somebody tries to cast a spell on you or put a curse on you that doesn't take effect, then that curse or spell goes back to the one that cast it. Hallelujah. I had a guy one thousand revival in Annapolis, Maryland. He come running and slid in the altar. He was the leader of the Ghost Riders motorcycle gang. His wife was a seventh generation witch, Wicca. He said, I've tried everything I can to stop this revival. And he said, whatever you guys got is more powerful than I got. He said, I, I chant and incant against you. And he said, the devil actually come and shook me out of my bed last night while you guys was over there praying and worshiping God. Hallelujah. That cat slept in a coffin at night and drank cat blood. About that one time in Louisiana camp, they got all over the UPC. I used to drink cat blood. Remember that? He slept in a coffin at night. He was in the mafia. When he got when he got the Holy Ghost, the Padrone called him over and they took him over. And the Padrone told him, said, if you ever get out of church, we're going to kill you. Man, that dude ain't going to backslide. Hallelujah. <laughs> the law of spiritual return. The law of spiritual return. Last week when I was preaching for Brother T.W. Barnes in Minden, Louisiana, somebody come and, and sacrificed a sow hog and put the guts and the blood out on the front porch of the church where I was preaching for Brother T.W. Barnes. They said, we don't mind Barnes being here, and we don't mind Mahaney being somewhere else. We don't want you guys together, the Satanists. And Brother Barnes walked out on the porch and said, Hear O Israel, Lord our God, the Lord, He is one. And you can hear cars taking off from all around that place. We're more superficial and supernatural. We've changed the upper room to the supper room. The way some of you dress brings sensuous spirits. Come on. You women can't understand why guys look at you and you dress with those splits and tight skirts and low blouses and you want them to look at you. Come on. You got to understand why the boy's got a gender problem when dad's hair is as long as mama's hair. Hair is not a Bible standard of holiness. Hair is a question of headship. 
It shows that you ladies are under subjection to, to your husband, to your pastor, to Christ, and to God. I thank both of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for that blessing. Hallelujah. Spirits and curses follow families. I will visit the iniquities of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. The first generation embraces, embraces the truth. The second generation codifies the truth. The third generation modifies it. And the fourth generation erases the truth. Now listen to this. Every fifth generation, every fifth generation has the ability to rise up and break the curse off their generation and have a revival that will shake their world if they'll do it. But you've got to get off your duff and do it. Every fifth generation. Five is the number of grace in the Hebrew. One is Echad. Echad stain shalosh arba chamesh. Five is the number of grace. Now, the Hebrew language is a hard language to learn. You spell, there, There's no vowels in the Hebrew language. A-E-I-O-U and I guess it's still sometimes W-Y it was when I went to school. And uh, I had 11 years of school and five in the first grade and six in the second. <laughs> no, I went for, I was in the 10th grade two terms. Kennedys and Johnsons. Hallelujah. <laughs> but the Hebrew language is a hard language to learn. It has no vowels. And you spell Noah N H. And it's pronounced Nuach. Nuach. You spell grace H N. And it's pronounced Hen. And at the lowest point in Noah's life, N H looked up. And God looked back at Noah H N. Grace looked back at the lowest point in his life. Grace is nothing but Noah spelled backwards. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and, and the fifth time Noah's name is mentioned, he finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. God took the letter grace and put it in Abram's name. Abraham. It's Abraham. Grace. Put it in his name. Sarah. His wife. Put grace in her name. Hallelujah. David had five stones that killed a giant. Five is a number of grace. The first time Ruth's name is mentioned in the Bible, the fifth time, she finds Boaz. The fifth time Boaz's name is mentioned, he finds Ruth. The anointing oil has five ingredients. The incense has five ingredients. There's a five by five by five foot cubic altar that has five offerings for sin on it. God's gave the five-fold ministry to direct the church. A dove has nine feathers on each wing. Nine fruit of the Spirit, nine gifts of the Spirit, but the five feathers in the back directed, that's the five-fold ministry. Hallelujah. The fifth dimension of Calvary is when He paid the crimson cash to buy us out of sin's prison house. The crown was the first dimension. The hands was the second dimension. The feet was the third dimension. The spear, uh, the back was the fourth dimension. The spear in the side was the fifth dimension. Every fifth generation... They've got the ability to rise up and break the curse off if we'll do it. God created Adam in paradise. And Adam sinned, and it went down for five generations. And in the fifth generation from Adam, there was a gentleman born named Mahalatliel. And his name means I'll praise God again. In the fifth generation, he brought a revival. It went down from Mahalatliel to Noah. And five generations from him, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah... Walked out of the ark and it began to go down again. And five generations from him, there was two twin brothers born named Peleg and Yachtan. And Yachtan was an idol worshiper. And Peleg means I'll follow Jehovah. Five generations. Then it started going down again. Five generations from them, there was a man born named Abraham. Every fifth generation, we can rise up and break the curse off if we'll do it. When Simon was one of the spies, went into Jericho. He was in Jericho the other day. See that mountain back there, the Mount of Temptation? There's little caves. Did you notice those caves in that mountain? That's where the, that's where the spies hid and, and, and scoped out Jericho. Hallelujah. Solomon went down. There was a woman there that run a little house on the walls named Rahab. 
they fell in love. After they took the city, they got married, and Solomon and Rahab had a little baby, and his name was Boaz. Boaz and Ruth had a baby, and his name was Obed. Obed and his wife had a baby, and his name was Jesse. Jesse and his wife, five generations later, had a baby, and his name was David, that brought the Davidic worship to Israel. Hallelujah. 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 Say, every fifth generation can break the curse off. You say, well, what's that got to do with us, Brother Mahaney? We happen to be living right in the middle of the fifth generation from Azusa Street. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. We're in the fifth generation from Azusa Street. And if we'll learn how to worship Him one more time and bring our families under the blood, we'll have a revival that will break the curse off of our generation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen to me. God made a covenant with David. It's called the sure mercy of David. He said, my mercy is built up for you forever, David. But I'll never remove my mercy from David or his seed. Say, what's that got to do with us? When you was born into Messiah, you was born into the throne of David. When they got to sing in here tonight, I felt the hot blood of David in my veins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God told David, said, if your kids stray, I'll take a rod and beat them back in. But whatever I do, I'll never remove my sure mercies from David. David had been dead 30 years. And his son Solomon went off into idolatry. And God came to Solomon and said, I'm taking the kingdom from your hand, Solomon. And then God stopped and said, no, I can't. I remember a covenant I made with your father 30 years ago. I can't take my mercy from the seed of David. Hallelujah. 100 years after David is dead and in the grave, there's a young man named Abijam who was a temporary king in Israel. He was the wife of David and a, or a child of David and a concubine. And God tells Abijam, I'm going to blow the lamp out in Israel. And uh, then he says, no, I can't. 100 years after David's death. And he said, because I remember a covenant I made with your father David. Hallelujah. I can't take my mercy from David. 300 years after David's dead and in the ground, Sennacherib encamps around Hezekiah. And God tells Hezekiah, I'm going to let him have you. And then God stops and says, no, I can't. 300 years ago, I made a covenant with David that I'd never take my mercy from his house. Hallelujah. Have you ever wondered why Jesus was somewhere between Jerusalem and Jericho? Nothing could stop him. Death couldn't stop him. Disease couldn't stop him. Finances couldn't stop him. The elements couldn't stop him. The Roman Empire couldn't stop him. Everybody was screaming, but there was one old guy who began to holler. He was a blind man named Bartimaeus, and he began to cry, Yeshua ben David, Jesus, thou son of David. And David, and, and the Bible said Jesus stood still that day. You know why? He was touching the covenant. And every time one of you mamas get out there and begin to worship and pray and begin to intercede, and pray for your family. It reminds that God of a covenant He cut with David. Hallelujah. 750. Next year, next year in Jerusalem is going to be the 3,000th anniversary of the city of Jerusalem. 3,000 years ago was when David took it from the Jebusites. You know what? When you get to worship a God, like last night, I believe it was last night, I said, let's all shout. Or night before last. Let's all shout on credit. God said, I can't resist that because... I've cut a covenant with that kind of worship and praise. The anointing destroys the yoke. The anointing destroys the yoke. And there's some of you here tonight that you have faced rage, you have faced loneliness, you did, you've faced depression, sometimes in the evening. I said last night or the night before, there's a lady who's looking in her coffee cup. A lady come and told me, she said, I was the one you was talking about, Brother Manny. You could have called my name. I'm talking about somebody tonight in the evening. There's just a loneliness settles on you like a wet sheet, and you can't fight that loneliness. God's going to break that generation curse off of you tonight. Here's something several of you are facing. You'll, you'll worship God and feel so good, and you'll walk out of church, 
And before the night's over, there will be just a drop in your spirit, almost like you've got a spiritual hangover, and you just, I just don't know if I even got anything or not, and the devil steals that seed. The blood's fixing to break that curse off of you. Come on. Hallelujah. The anointing is fixing to shatter that. I said the anointing is fixing to shatter that. I'd trade all of our intellectualism if we could be twice as anointed in the church today. God, let your anointing come into this place right now. Turn to the one beside you and say, two women anointed Jesus. Now watch this. One was a very devout Jewish lady, and she took the oil. She took the oil. I'm going to use you here a minute, Slate. She took the oil and put it on his head. And you know what Jesus said? She anointed my body. Where did he put the oil? Where she put the oil? On his, and he said, she anointed my body. The other was a sinner woman. A sinner woman. And she took that alabaster box and broke it. And broke it. And she got down and poured it on his feet. And you know what he said? She anointed my body. She anointed my body. One poured the oil on his head, the other on his feet. And both times he said, she anointed my body. I was in a chemistry lab in Jerusalem about four years ago. I was studying this. To get one pound of spikenard that that woman poured on the feet of Jesus, they had to crush 500,000 rose petals. They had to crush 500,000 rose petals to get that pound of spikenard. And once she broke that box, it could never be used again. And she poured that oil on his feet. One of them said, don't do that. He said, whatever this woman's done is going to be told of a memorial to her, what she's done to me, as long as the gospel's preached. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody say, two women anointed him. Say, that last woman was a sinful woman, probably a Gentile. That was part of the Gentile church I'm in. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now listen, she anointed him 24 hours before Calvary. 24 hours before Calvary. 24 hours before Calvary. If I was to take spikenard and I'd mix it two-thirds water and one-third spikenard and I'd put it on his feet, I could stand ten feet away and seven days later I could still smell that spikenard coming off of his feet. Two-thirds water and one-third spikenard. And I can stand ten feet away, and over a week later I can still, through the shoes and socks, I can smell that spikenard coming off his feet. If I took pure spikenard, pure spikenard, not mixed, and put it on your feet, 21 days later, standing 30 feet away, I can smell that spikenard. She put that on his feet 24 hours before Calvary. Say, what are you trying to tell us, preacher? The only thing that he took with him to the whipping post, to the arrest, to that cross, to the tomb, was what that woman poured on him. The last day church. Hallelujah. The only thing we're going to take into the arena of our families and our lives is what we worship and pray down on one another when we come in here in this service right tonight and Sunday night, next Wednesday night. Hallelujah. See, that's how imperative it is that we worship God. Come on. Psychiatrists and psychoanalysis are going to take care of the problems inside. The blood is going to break that curse off of you, and the blood is going to shatter it, and the anointing is going to break that curse. Hallelujah. 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 The only thing I see him now, they come pushing back the low hanging olive branches. You can hear the swinging of lanterns and the talking and the footfall of men. I still feel something when I walk under those 3,000 year old olive trees past her in Gethsemane. I. I I usually go first by myself because I get very emotional when I get to Calvary and Gethsemane. He didn't see me up here in this reverend rig on. But he's laying there praying, Let this cup pass from me! 
And it's a matter of record. Three times he said, let the cup pass from me. But the third time, he looks in, sees me in cell block J, cell number 14. A devil worshiper. A biker. A $300 a day drug addict. Abused. My earliest memory is seeing my father cut my mother's throat with his knife. And he said, I've got to drink that cup. Because Charlie's got to have that inward healing. Just a few weeks before my father died, I called my father on the phone in California and I said, I want to tell you something, Dad. He said, What? I said, I love you. Never could tell my dad that. He beat me with chains and metal fishing rods and I used to think about killing him at night. And I said, I love you. I just prayed through. And he said, who is this? And I said, it's your son. He said, what happened to you? And I said, I got the Holy Ghost, Dad. It was real quiet. I said, Dad? And he said, uh, I'm glad to hear it, son. I said, I'll talk to you later. I'm thinking about coming home. I want to see you. Two days later, they found him strangled to death on his own vomit. But God give me that healing. And I don't have to carry that into every revival I go to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God give me that healing. There was an anger and a rage. There was a rage in my family. There was a, and, and, and the anointing broke that rage. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There was depression. But the anointing broke that depression. And the anointing can break that yoke in your life tonight. When he went and they grabbed him, and Judas kissed him, and they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I'm he. And they all fell backwards. If I'd have been them, I'd have got up and left. And they got up again. And he said, I'm he. And they arrested him. And when they took those precious hands and twisted them up behind his back and began to lead him to the house of Caiaphas, we've been down in that cell, buddy. Keller, three floors down, pitch black. It's in the pit. It is the actual place, and I cover the evidence, where they kept Jesus overnight. We stood there and had a prayer meeting the other day in that cell. I wonder what he thought about that night when he was down there linked up against those old cold walls by himself. He saw me in there. He saw you in there, Slick. Hallelujah. He saw you in there. Come on. And he said, I'm going to go that I can break that curse. And you know the only thing he had with him was that incense, that anointing that that woman poured on his feet. When they had him on that whipping post and they was laying that whip across his back, you know the only thing he had with him? He had with him when that whip came down, he had that anointing oil that that woman poured. And I'm telling you, some of you are going to be in the arena and have been in the arena, and the only thing that's going to keep you is the anointing that we love on each other and worship on each other and waste on each other. Come on, lift your hands and worship Him. Come on, worship Him. Pray in that Holy Spirit just a little bit. I come against the unfaithfulness, God, that tries to keep me out of church. I come against the depression. I come against all those spirits. For behold, I, the Lord, would speak unto you, my children. You say, what does all this mean to me? I take one hand with the bloody nail print, and I put it to my forehead where the crown of thorns was. I take the other hand, and I put it on my side where the spear was. And I hold them both to you, and I say, this is what this means to you. I've called this church to be a peculiar people. I've called this church and put it in this place. That this church might be a place, a hospital, where people that's wounded can come and be healed. People that's been hurt by religion even can come and be healed. I've called this church to be a ministering body. I've called this church to be a place 
that men and women and boys and girls and families could come and the lamb would be slain. And people wouldn't look at the priest. I've sent a shepherd among you that is not worried about ego. But he wants to lead you into a dimension of revival that you've never been in. I stand here with my hands outstretched. And I say, I've called you to be a hospital where the wounded could come and get the oil and the wine put in their wounds. And the Samaritan can carry them to the inn. And I'll pay the money. I'll pay enough money for two days. That's the two days, the two dispensations that I promised my Gentile church that I would turn back to my Jewish people. And you've suffered. You've hurt. I saw you, my daughter, when your husband was asleep and you turned over and you wept into that pillow. I saw you. I saw you, my son, as you would slam your fist into a wall or a tree or something because of that rage. And I tell you, there's a healing bomb in Gilead. There's a healing touch, and it's in my anointing. And I've called this church to be the hospital, the place that my bomb has rubbed into the wounds of the hurting people. If you'll come to me, I'll start the healing process this night in your life. I, your Lord, have spoken. If I ever felt the anointing of God on the service, the anointing of God's here. No one like Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me and my family. No one, no one like Jesus. to me. I appreciate you coming and I appreciate you doing it, but I'll tell you how I think the Holy Spirit wants us to do tonight. I want all the sisters in the church to come to this side, all the sisters and all the brothers to come to my right, all the sisters. You're Just slip over here quickly, brother. I want everybody in the house to come. I don't care what church you go to. If you believe Jesus was divine, I want all the sisters to come down to the front. Let's move quickly. From this pulpit on, I want the sisters on this side. From this pulpit on, I want the brethren on this side. Come on, we're going to have a ministry here tonight. Come on, let's move, folks. Make a path right. Come on, you bro. Come right up here and walk across the place. Come on, right up here. Come on. You built platform. You can walk on one. Hallelujah. Come on, just quickly. Let's move right, right on around. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Come on, let's just worship God while we're away. Move on over, brother. Move on over. Come on, move up close. Move on over here, brother. Move up close to the front, sisters, so these sisters can. Come on, move up close to the front. Close and these sisters can get it. Now listen to me. I don't know all the variables of your life. I don't know what you've done to get here. And I, I don't know all the circumstances of what you've done and what you faced and the dark points of your life. But I know a God that can put it all in the computer. I know a God that can put it all in the computer and, and, and bring it up on the screen and say, I've got the answer for it. And the answer is, my anointing will break the yoke. I want us to have prayer circles. I want five, six, or seven sisters in a circle. Just take hands and make circles. Come on, let's have prayer circles right here. Just make circles. You brothers, the same thing. Come on, make prayer circles. I want two to get in the circle. Quickly, two to get in the circle. And I want everybody to lay hands on my minister. Come on, everybody lay hands on my minister too. Two get in the circle, quickly. And everybody lay hands on my minister too. Come on. Quick, I want everybody ministered. I want the anointing on everybody in this place. Come on. Come on. God's turned this place into a hospital. There's a doctor in the house. There's a doctor in the house. I want two in the circle and everybody minister to them. Come on, this is deliverance night for Pentecostals. This is healing night for Pentecostals. The yoke breakers here. Come on, get a burden, sisters. Get a burden. The only thing that your friend might carry into the arena is that anointing that you're praying on her. Come on. Come on, I want everybody ministered to. Two more get in the circle. 